small shifts can be a big change for for a family, for a smallholder farmer, for that mother that is with her children alone and have to get food and get money. So we have to be awareness of all this this kind of perspective, especially after uh, the pandemic. Hello and welcome to the Power of the Public Plate podcast, brought to you by ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, and the UN One Planet Network, with your host, myself, Josephine Hinz, based in ICLE's Berlin office, responsible for global initiatives of sustainable, innovative, and circular procurement. And I'm Peter De Franceschi, running ICLE's Brussels office and global food program. ICLE is a European and global network of local and regional governments committed to integrated sustainable development. And the UN One Planet Network works as a multi-stakeholder community across six programs, one of which is committed to the implementation of sustainable public procurement globally. In this podcast, we explore the stories of champions of food procurement around the world. In each episode, we bring you insightful and inspiring stories of how the public sector can influence the food value chain by leveraging its purchasing power. Join us as we talk to public sector staff, policy advisors and experts to learn how to support smallholder farmers, serve healthy and nutritious meals, source locally and climate friendly. In this episode, we travel to the state of Bahia in Brazil, where we talk to Leticia Baird. Leticia is a public prosecutor, performing for over 10 years in low socioeconomic areas in the state of Bahia. She led the Sustainable School Program, an institutional initiative to promote the Brazilian public policy of providing school meals as a fundamental guarantee. The Sustainable School Program has been featured at important events in the past and latest at the UN Nations pre-summit within the UN Food System Summit and a session on nutrition for growth and cohesion. In the episode, we explore the story behind the program with a focus on healthy eating, combating childhood obesity, and empowering smallholder farmers in compliance with Brazilian international commitments. We take a deep look at how the law can enable sustainable food procurement, the change from processed food to freshly cooked plant-rich meals, and how to navigate this change, celebrating the wide variety of vegetables, legumes, and fruits that Bahia has to offer. Let's dive into it. We bring you the Titia Bed. So it's very nice to talk to you today and, and to connect um, with you, Letitia. Indeed. Maybe a first question to start with the flavor of, uh, of the area. Could you tell us a bit what is special in terms of food, some, some, some dishes in Bahia? Hello, hi. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you uh, to bring the Sustainable School Program from Brazil to join the UN One Planet Network and local governments for sustainability. Um, first, I'd like to say that your efforts and initiatives target to face social and environmental challenges through a local perspective are very important for countries such as Brazil, marked by social inequality, but also for a really good and very rich food. Here in Bahia, we are blessed with many kinds of food and nutrition. Here in Bahia, we have a very rich uh, food and we are famous around the world exactly because our food is a scent, a scent food. Our dishes are made with love and with uh, all the colors that Brazil does have. So um, you are all invited to be here with us to, to taste our typical dishes such as the acarajé, caruru, vatapá. Uh, we, are, we are very rich, we have very rich foods, especially sustainable foods here in Brazil. We use lots of beans. We have more than 60 uh, kinds of beans here. Uh, we have 
uh, kinds of potatoes, peanut. We have very traditional uh, cultures of food here that should be more uh, tasted and showed uh, to the world because they are also sustainable food. That's really amazing to hear that diversity and, and also that passion to, to bring in all the flavors into also public meals. And that's what, what we want to explore with you today. And I remember when, when we first talked a, a while ago, you described that for the food value chain, it's really about that everything is linked. And it's very important to understand that in the food system, really everything is, is interlinked and dependent on each other. Can you describe a bit more what, what you mean by that and how important it is for procurement to be aware of that? Talk about public procurement and the, the food chain is very important nowadays not just because this have uh, a special social impact, but also environmental. Um, firstly, if you don't mind, I'd like to just to, to uh, present an overview about the Sustainable School Program. That is our initiative here in Brazil. The Sustainable School Program is in an initiative of the public ministry of the state Bahia in Brazil to promote the Brazilian public policy of school feeding through a systemic approach with a focus on promoting its quality, food security, malnutrition, and combating childhood obesity through the empowerment of the smallholder farmers in the awareness of the sustainability requirements. Target to comply with the existing Brazilian international commitments, such as the United Nations Sustainable Develop Development Goals. So this is our, our initiative here in Brazil, and it's also connected, uh, linked uh, with public procurement. The role of the procurement within the food chain is very important. Um, in Brazil, public procurement must observe the following criteria, economic, social, and envir environmental efficiency. Just to mention in Brazil, public procurement is estimated at 20% of the gross domestic product. In addition, with regard to the public procurement of school meals, in 2019 reference year, the federal agency transferred about $1 million to cities and states to purchase school meals to be offered in public schools. So uh, the government, besides of being an economic regulator and a benchmark for private sector, is mainly a huge buyer. In the case of the school meals offered uh, in public schools here in Bahia, the main buyer is the city mayors. And for this reason, the public ministry has an important role of inspection. First, because these are purchases made with public money. And second, because they are purchases that must comply with legal requirements. Moreover, the Brazilian school feeding law expressly determines the, the duty to purchase food that's not only healthy, but also sustainable. So uh, the sustainable procurement can be part of a solution through integrating environmental and social considerations into all stages of the food value chain and public procurement in order to reduce impacts on human health, the environmental challenges, and the implementation of the human rights. Mm -hmm. And could you give some examples of what is typically the sustainability or social criteria are. Just to give an exa a few examples. And I also wonder, uh, when you say uh, that there are targets and are these mandatory criteria? Sure. Uh, especially uh, talking about the school, the national school feeding program, our law expressly established that the sustainable uh, uh, the sustainability must be considered when the nutritionist prescribes the school meals. Um, moreover, we, we can mention uh, this same law, the National School Fearing Program, it's a law here in Brazil, uh, 
uh, establish that the government should purchase at very least 30% of uh, the funds transferred to the city mayors with the smallholder farmers. The purchase from smallholder farmers and that there is this legislative environment supporting this idea, I'm wondering how does it look like in practice? Is it being complied with? What, what are your insights in, in Bahia, maybe also a few years ago, in terms of is the, uh, are the local governments purchasing from, from smallholder farmers? Or was that, was that kind of a challenge or an issue? Not just the National School Feeding Program law talks about uh, in a very clear way using this term sustainability patterns. The, the law used this exactly term, but also the general law about uh, public procurement established that the sustainability should be uh, a criteria to be used by the, the, the government, government here in Brazil. Indeed, um, there is a non-compliance of the government uh, with this kind of legal criteria. Um, for example, we can, we can mention uh, in after the, the fostering actions performed by the Sustainable School Program, technical auditing showed a higher public procurement with the smallholder farmers uh, during the pilot stage. Um, and we had uh, access to the public procurement, the contracts. In, in 2017, year of reference, before the implementation of the Sustainable School Program, Barrocas City, one of the cities that joined the, the initiative, didn't purchase any items of the school feeding through smallholder farmers uh, in a clear contempt towards the school feeding law. Uh, in 2018, with the fostering actions promoted by the Sustainable School Program, Barrocas City employed 70 3% of the federal funds transferred to the municipality to purchase the school feeding directly through the smallholder farmers, something about uh, uh, $15,000. And the public procurement of sustainable food increased 27% between those reference years. That reflects real measures of sustainable procurement. Uh, likewise, uh, another city, Biritinga, in two years after joining the Sustainable School Program, near, nearly doubled the public procurement through smallholder farmers. How does it then work in terms of uh, having food from small fa farmers? You said there is a certain mandatory percentage. Does that mean that uh, whoever wants to win this uh, tender, this bid, needs to organize and go to farmers and buy from smallholders the food? The federal agency transfer the funds to the city mayors, to the municip municipalities, and the municipalities uh, buy purchase with the smallholder farmers. The city mayors uh, are obliged to buy, to purchase the school meals uh, at very least 30% of the funds transferred with the smallholder farmers, at very least 30%. But unfortunately, in many cities here in, in the state of Bahia, Brazil, um, the, the, city, the mayor the, of these cities are, aren't complying with this legal uh, criteria. So uh, I, I guess it's, it's important to clarify that, but why the public ministry, what does that have to do with sustainable procurement. Uh, as as uh, we said, I'm a public prosecutor. And in Brazil, the prosecution service, besides other assignments, is likewise responsible to ensure the effective respect of the social rights, such as the right of school feeding and the environmental issues. And also, it's our duty, the inspection of the use of public funds at public procurement as well. So uh, it's our duty to, to inspect how the city mayors 
uh, spends these funds. Uh, so we we are connected with this this federal law that uh, imposes that obliges the cities to purchase at very least 30 percent with the smallholder farmers. I'm really curious, and I think it's it's a good time to stay to take one step back to learn a bit more about how did the program that kind of procurement pilot start. Can you tell us a bit more about the design of of the initiative? Oh, of course, it will be a pleasure. Let's introduce the sustainable school program here. Well, the school feeding also in Brazil means a historical challenge. But on the other hand, This challenge brings in its legal framework powerful tools to go beyond the improvement of the quality of the school lunches. And it makes possible to manage at the same time issues such as human and environmental health and poverty eradication. So the sustainable school was designed after a local a local diagnosis in regarding issues related to the public policy of school feeding that among other findings showed those specific issues you asked uh, about uh, the the previous part of before starting the program so we the finding were the need for improvement in the school menus in regards to nutrition and quality the evidence of health disorders in the school population malnutrition obese and extremely thin students the non-compliance of the local governments with the legal purchase obligations towards the smallholder farmers, just that topic we were talking before. And also we could, uh, uh, we could find that the smallholder farmers uh, got a substandard conditions, small scale production, uh, lack of capacity to deal with public procurement, and the social misinformation about the role of the food system in promoting human and environmental health and as well to cooperate with the poverty eradication. Uh, therefore, uh, the need for improvement in the quality of the school feeding through the promotion of the smallholder farmers uh, and the need to manage the public health disease has made, have made up the background to the foundation of the sustainable school program. Josephine told me also, and I found that very interesting, that uh, the food procurement program also supports uh, women-led farms and producers. Could you elaborate on that? That I found quite uh, advanced and interesting. Of course, sure, definitely. Uh, the smallholder farmers uh, here in our region, in Brazil, especially here in the semi-arid, um, are compounded mostly for rural and black women. Um, as we said, the Sustainable School Program has one of its main goals, the empowerment of the smallholder farmers addressed toward poverty education. The Brazilian school feeding operates through a smallholder friendly procurement that is just the national school feeding program law it's a smallholder friendly procurement uh, we have here in brazil so the sustainable school uh, fostered the implementation of that law aimed at giving priority to the smallholder farmers and traditional brazilian people that in most cases are composed of rural and black women it's very common here in, in our region that the men uh, go to other states to get better jobs. And in most cases, these this strong women uh, stay here and they have to, to, to stay with the kids, to educate the kids and to provide the, the food, the meals of the day. And so the smallholder farmers here are really, really, uh, in most cases, compounded by those uh, strong black women. It's true that I often hear procurement and, and small farmers also in Europe. And this is very interesting that, that you apply it. So my question would be, do you know how is this a small farmer defined? What's a small farmer? And who... Uh, 
organizes the the transport, let's say, the logistics from the small farm to the city? Well, um, it's a, a, a really hard point and it's crucial to give attention to this agenda. Uh, in our sustainable school program, this is a very special agenda because uh, it's connected with uh, the poverty education. Uh, so we, we fostered actions here to promote. Uh, so we, we made some meetings and appointment with government, with uh, uh, agencies of the government that here in, uh, works to support this, this, uh, this class, the social class. Here in Bahia, we have some agency, state agencies that are focused on supporting to give uh, technical uh, support to the smallholder farmers, trying to, to improve their knowledge, to improve their production, their scale, and also to, to help them to deal with public procurement. So we could provide after our fostering actions cook trainings to those women, small producers, to improve the quality and to add value to their products, and also workshops about agroecological practices, technical support to deal with public procurement, besides of on-site visits to the rural areas where performed by, by our initiative. Of course, it's not uh, uh, an easy work, it's, it's really, a hard um, in a practice in a, in a, in a practical way uh, and it get, and it gets time uh, we have to to share with them to sh to be with them but it's a pleasure it's amazing to to know from their knowledge their traditional knowledge and also uh, when we see they they are improving their their structure so it's basically the city, the mayors, then uh, the local government, let's say, that uh, do a, a sort of a market engagement. They go and approach the, the small farmers. They reach out to them and uh, see who, let's say, could supply uh, fruits and vegetables to the school feeding program, right? Yes, sure. The, the smallholder farmers, uh, supplies the, the the municipalities with their production and before and then we 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 can come back to the pilot project we we had some actions that prepared um, to propose the the first strategy um, after the diagnosis we, we took the diagnosis into consideration and then we proposed to the local mayors a strategy of action consistent in the redesign of the conventional school menus, which were usually made up of unhealthy processed animal products to a, a gradual implement of healthier menus, preferably consisting of plant-rich foods named as sustainable menus traditionally consumed and produced locally by smallholder farmers, as stipulated in the National School Feeding Program Law, a Brazilian public policy. All those menus were developed by the school nutritionists, who also took the students' acceptance into consideration. Just to mention, the pilot project started in 2018 and reached about 32,000 students and 150 schools in four cities located in a semi-arid region in the state of Bahia, Brazil, offering sustainable menus twice a week. Um, to transform the strategy, that strategy I've mentioned, into operational tactics, fostered measures were programmed through a systemic course of action linking skilled community, smallholder farmers, and government within the school feeding program policy. This is really impressive. Just a practical question also, are the school meals for free? All right, uh, it's important uh, to clarify here that in Brazil, uh, the school feeding is a right to every 
students uh, who attend public school. That's really amazing to hear and makes healthy food very accessible and socially inclusive. And I'm wondering, though, because often healthy and, and, and sustainable food is attributed also with higher cost as, as an argument against you know, taking the steps or investing in, in it. Um, but w was that ever an issue or what was that ever a challenge that you faced talking to local governments that sustainable meals would cost more for, for them? Well, indeed, that's a myth. In the specific case of the sustainable school program, there was no increase in the government's financial expenses to purchase the school lunches. First, because the foods replaced were usually processed foods and animal products, which are the most expensive food items in the school menus. Second, because this, replace, this replacement was paid for out of the funds saved by redirecting those funds that was previous, previously used to purchase unhealthy processed food to buy locally produced foods with a lower environmental impact. So uh, uh, so sometimes we, we hear this kind of, oh, uh, sustainable food is, is, is really uh, it's, it's high price, but indeed it's not. Uh, beans, potatoes, yucca, uh, corn, fruits, reg regional fruits, typical fruits, they are even even cheaper when compared to processed food. When we get the the contracts, the public contracts of the public procurement, we can see the prices, all this kind of stuff, and then we 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 get that information. Processed food is really uh, here in Brazil. Now I'm talking about from Bahia. Uh, it's it's it has a higher price when compared to sustainable and local food. I'm just uh, want to talk uh, about one more cost in regarding to environmental costs, because uh, we have a law here in Brazil that also talks about health, human and environmental health, and also uh, uh, and also uh, encourages uh, the observation of the criteria of the sustainability. In regarding to environmental costs, that it's also a cost that Uh, unfortunately, uh, governments um, still don't have the habit to pay attention to this to to this cost. But the environment from the environmental costs in the school feeding here in Bahia, Brazil, in our pilot project, researchers of the University of Manchester in scientific support to the sustainable school program calculated the climate impacts of the conventional menus compared to the sustainable menus offered to the students. Preliminary results showed that the implementation of sustainable menus at schools promoted the reduction in greenhouse gas emission values in 50% for nursery and 17% for secondary education in the 2019 reference year. Those are preliminary results, still unpublished, but kindly provided by the Take a Bite Out of Climate Change Research Group linked to the University of Manchester. Finally, uh, about this topic, it's important to note that the highest price to be considered, uh, we have no doubt, is the cost of treating healthy diseases resulting from poor eating habits. The healthcare cost to, to tackle the healthcare cost preventative and not uh, once um, yeah population is obese, for instance. Yeah. And one one question there, because you I really want to put the emphasis on, on this just for a moment, um, because you mentioned it also, what kind of role does the reduction of meat play in the school feeding program. And can you just explain to our listeners why it's so important to invest into a plant-rich diet? Uh, it's important to say that the national school uh, program, the school feeding program, establishes a legal criteria that must be observed in the prescription of school menus by the school nutritionists. According to that law, 
the school lunches menus must be must use basic food stuffs respecting the nutritional references the eating habits culture and food traditions of the locally based on sustainability and agric agricultural diversification of the region on healthy and adequate food this is our law our law says exactly that what i've 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 uh talk, said now so uh from that law that established that criteria the sustainable school program initially proposed a pilot trade, a pilot strategy, which was approved by the local mayors and their technical stuff. Through the redesign of the conventional school menus, those ones I said that are usually made up of unhealthy processed food and animal products, to an implement of healthier menus, consisting of plant-rich foods traditionally produced locally by smallholder farmers as stipulated in the law. Uh, with regard to this initial strategy, it's important to clarify that the proposal of the replacement of the processed and animal-based food has been built uh, based on the dia diagnosis about the structures of the schools that showed the following findings. That mean that the meat wasn't offered in the school lunches every day, when we, we made a uh, data service show us that first, the meat wasn't offered in the school lunches every day, that the meat when offered were mostly compounded by unhealthy processed food, just like beef jerky, sausage, canned meat, this kind of stuff, not healthy food, not healthy meat, let's say that. And also, uh, we could find that the school kitchens in our poor, vulnerable region here didn't have enough refrigerator and appliances to preserve fresh meat. And also, the insufficient funding provided by the federal government to the municipalities for purchasing the school lunches, something about seven cents up to 40 cents of dollar per student per day, a really short amount that should be invested under an efficient strategy. As we said, meat, especially a fresh meat, is it has a high price. And we are talking about a short money. Thank you. So I just wonder about the public procurement system at the school feeding, school nutrition. Is it typically a catering company that uh, delivers the food to the schools? Uh, the school lunches are prepared at every school. Oh, wow. The school cooks also have, have had, during the pilot project, trainings how to prepare uh, delicious, fresh and whole food uh, dishes. Um, we also can mention that uh, during the program, the school nutritionists um, uh, the, the the city the municipality had uh, is has is, is supposed to have a nutritionist that work just with the school issues so they the, the school nutritionist uh, prescribe the the school lunches for every level of students from nursery to high school and then they send the the prescription to the schools and the school cooks uh, are supposed to, to follow the prescription. Unfortunately, um, the schools uh, usually have poor conditions, as we said, few refrigerators, um, and it's, it's a, a, a challenge here for us mm -hmm. because at the same time, it's a, a, a big deal to prepare uh, the school fresh there at school. We also have many schools in poor conditions and to improve 150 schools, we are talking just in four cities, is really hard, especially um, talking now during the pandemic né, that uh, the money, the, in the funds is is even hard to the municipal, small municipality to get. But um, 
the school cooks during one of the fostering measures promoted by the sustainable school program was exactly school cooks trainings to to teach them how to prepare um fresh food in a way that it it, it gets the students acceptance because we we are talking about youth teenagers and and nowadays they are usually um very closer to processed food and it's a a, a really tough battle mm -hmm. to to win did you mention the teenagers and i myself have a teenager so it's on one hand it's also interesting that i feel that the young people are nowadays also at the uh, global level there are trends you know to eat less meat to be more vegan it's a cool thing so in that sense i pr probably they it's for them easier to 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 shift or surprising what i wonder is also you mentioned training uh, do you also combine the the school feeding with education do the at school do they also learn uh, where the food comes from about i don't know the the bayan food culture about how what sustainable food is what healthy food is do you combine that with the school feeding sure uh to to manage the all these challenges we developed a a step by step approach that consider three pillars the first pillar was the promotion of public hearings and dialogues with the decision makers school community smallholder farmers social councils government agencies where we could present and talk about the whole perspective through the lens of the public policy of school feeding and its impact on the students health poverty eradication and public procurement target to smallholder farmers linking the food chain value and environmental challenge the second pillar of the approach was the promotion of fostering actions such as exactly that you you asked me the educational activities at school trainings for the school cooks to teach them how to prepare fresher and whole food also pedagogic workshops targeted to the school teachers and to the school dietitians to discuss the importance of healthy eating habits and environmental issues uh, were also implemented Uh, indeed, uh, among these educational activities aimed at supporting a healthy and nutritional, nutritious diet, uh, the program promotes a special school fair. The Sustainable School Program has in its schedule, annual schedule, uh, a special school fair called BioCertão. Um, Sertão means rural here for us. Então, something like bio organic uh, rural something like that this event has been targeted towards bringing the smallholder farmers and the society around the sustainable food system subject inside the school we we the 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 city mayors and the school Uh, the, the teachers, they bring the community, the smallholder farmers, and also the students inside uh, a school, the big one normally, usually. And then um, there, there are very, uh, there are many actions promoted, such as lectures about this, this kind of, um, of highlight topics, Uh, climate change, environmental, obesity, all these kinds of topics. Hearings, cultural presentations with this kind of connected with this, this subject. Cooking contests. We had a, a great cooking contest with, with children. Very uh, amazing. It was really amazing. And sustainable menu tastings offered to the whole community, to the whole community who composed the school fair. Uh, who composes the school fair schedule. Mm -hmm. So we invite the, the community, the local community, to go inside the school, uh, to share the initiative, to present da data, surveys, to present uh, scientific positions, and also uh, the municipalities, the city mayors, offer to, to those people uh, Uh, sustainable menu tastings so it's it's really fine because sometimes people think uh, but what's whole food what does uh, a, a plant-rich food means 
uh, is it fine or is not fine? So it's a great opportunity to share with the the, the community this this kind of, of idea. And the, the third pillar of our initiative in this step-by-step -step approach uh, is related to the evaluation of results. During the pilot stage, one of the main guidelines of the program was the concern with monitoring and measuring data of the results of the fostering actions related uh, to the goals of the project. For example, comparative analysis between conventional versus sustainable menus showed that the quality of the school menus were improved during uh, the pilot project. It was possible to verify the reduction in the offer of unhealthy processed food in the school meals, and also uh, a similar or even greater amount of energy and protein in the sustainable menus with less saturated fat, less sugar and sodium, more fiber in addition to be free of cholesterol. Another important finding was the reduction in the prevalence of fitness and malnutrition. Also, a significant reduction in cardiovascular risk markers, the satisfactory linear growth, also the reduction in the prevalence of anemia. Those are preliminary results, it's still uh, unpublished but kindly provided by the research, the following researcher institutions, Fiocruz Bahia and Escola Baiana de Medicina and Saúde Pública, something like Medicine and Public Health University College we have here in Bahia. They uh, monitor, uh, mon mon monitored the, the pilot project exactly to, to provide us this important data. The scientific data and results shown are used to improve acceptance within the stakeholders. It's really amazing to hear that you're incorporating the kind of monitoring and it's very much data driven. It's not just, yes, we need more healthy food, let's do it. And, and here are a few examples, but you're actually evaluating the impacts and you've shared with us a few um, really how sustainable meals can tackle kind of health issues and educate the next generation and how important that is for the local community as well. Um, I'm actually wondering as well, because in, in Bahia, and you mentioned that before, that we, we talked about the, the local kind of smallhold farmers and, and that many of them are, are uh, women. Um, and I believe you also mentioned um, when we talked earlier that you also incorporate indigenous knowledge in the menu design and their um, practices of food production. Can you share a little bit more um, with us what, what that means and how you, you do that and how important that is? All right. Um, the ancestral knowledge, whether by native peoples or Quilombola Black people here in our region, we, we talk about Quilombolas uh, that are uh, Black people here uh, in from Bahia. Uh, well, uh, right. These groups are protected and encouraged by Brazilian law, and it should be considered at the sustainable food procurement. For this purpose, um, the sustainable school program during the pilot stage proposed the redesign of the conventional menus, those ones with processed food, to a gradual implement of healthier menus, preferably uh, produced uh, for those traditional communities. During the, the pilot project, the implementation of the Sustainable School Menus proposal was preceded by surveys of smallholder farmers' production driven to identify the seasonable food items produced, uh, produced uh, for these groups. Uh, so, uh, besides bolstering the school nutritionists with data regarding local and seasonable production that enabled fresh and coherent recipes, that that data could also provide the rescue of traditional cultures, such as the peanut growing tradition here in Bahia. 
also it allowed the development of rereading of typical dishes from a healthier and more sustainable proposal, such as the sustainable feijoada, the school lunches, uh, the school nutritionists prescri prescribed a, a, a dish called sustainable feijoada. Uh, I don't know, um, but if you know, but in Brazil we have a, a, a typical dish called feijoada. It's delicious. I, I had the pleasure of, of trying it multiple times. It's it's very delicious. And I actually tried a plant-based option of feijoada. Um, so the sustainable version, is is it plant-based as well? Yes. And then uh, the, the school nutritionists, nutritionists uh, prescribed a sustainable version exactly to take off the processed food because feijoada, um, in, in despite of being a typical dish and famous one, uh, it uh, this recipe you use uh, processed food, processed meat, jerked meat from pig, this this kind of, of meat, processed meat, and very with uh, too much uh, sodium. And the nutritionists made a sustainable version um, using uh, uh, ingredients such as black beans, sweet potato, pumpkin, beetroot, kale, coconut, and local nuts. And all these amazing whole foods locally produced. They could uh, prescribe a local nut called uh, liquidy. Liquidy is a, is a kind of re region, uh, a nut of our region and it's really it's, it's a it has a a strong scent and a strong flavor but when it gets into the feijoada it's really really nice it's difficult uh, leticia to focus on public procurement when it's dinner time mm -hmm. here and you tell us mm -hmm. about all this i had a feijoada here in brussels it was not good at all so i'm looking forward to eat a, a real one or a sustainable one it's all it's really really fine mm. um we we had the support of um uh uh an agents and non-profit organization mm. uh, that um sent us for here in bahia sent to the municipality the support of a chef a chef specialized chef that taught uh, not just the school cooks but also uh, he gave classes to the smallholder farmers, to the to rural women, to teach them how to prepare, how to add value to the products and all this kind of lessons. And so I could taste um, more than one time <laughs> uh, the sustainable feijoada and it's really amazing. Here we have um, a, a great... Um, Great opportunity to eat a very, very colored and scent, uh, amazing, amazing food. This is really inspiring. Also, for me, the fact that, as you said at the very beginning, uh, explained and showcased how a national supportive uh, procurement legislation can really change the way, uh, for instance, school feeding and school nutrition is happening, right? Also in the way that you explained that there is this mandatory criteria to that 30% comes from small farms. And then I wonder, it's interesting also here from a European perspective, because we have here the farm to fork strategy and modalities will be developed for mandatory criteria. But then again, I, I just wonder, since you also are a, a legal expert, but how is it then if in case of non-compliance, if uh, local governments or schools don't comply, what happens? Are we still in the pilot phase or is that is it now already compulsory and uh, all schools, in every school, 30% uh, should actually come from small farms, smallholder farms? Well, uh, as we said, um, one of the, the duties of the public ministry is to foster uh, the fundamental guarantees, such as the right to an edu adequate food, school food. Uh, so the, the public prosecutor here in Brazil, when we are talking about this kind of collective fundamental rights, we had uh, a special agenda with the city mayors 
trying to to make them um, to respect the law. Let's say like like that. So then we 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 make this kind of data service like as I, I, I talk in the, the beginning. And when we, we identify, when we verify some kind of uh, non-compliance, we, we make an appointment, an appointment with the city mayor and his lawyer, and then we explain the situation, and then we say, oh, hello, please, you have to, um, to respect the law, you are not purchasing with the smallholder farmers uh, with the th at least 30% that the law prescribes. So how do you intend to, uh, to respect the law? Otherwise, I'm, I'm going, the public ministry is going to suit, suit uh, uh, the, the municipality. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, indeed, uh, it's important to clarify that before to take the case to the court, we are first uh, concerned about the improvements, about the final result. It's it's our main guideline. So um, sometimes um, take the case to the court isn't the very fast way to solve uh, the problem, especially when we are talking about children, when we are about in a when we are talking about food and health. So um, uh, because of this, 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 this situation, this scenario, uh, we proposed to the city mayors this program, and then we invited, we invited the city mayors to join this proposal, trying to, to, phys to, to foster, trying to implement feasible and fast actions uh, aimed at improving uh, some some issues that the, the municipality wasn't respecting. So this kind of uh, agenda works like that. We have some dialogues. We are able to talk with the municipality and try to make the city mayor to respect the law, proposing mm -hmm. uh, and also asking him to present to the public ministry some plans some action plans with proposals as well. And when the city mayors don't do that, then we propose and then the city mayors thinks about that with his technical staff and hearing the population, something like that. That's really good to hear that you're you're using kind of a dialogue based step by step approach to to advance um, in terms of the sustainable food procurement. And this actually touches upon um, w one question that, that I have that, that we haven't discussed so far. And, and after that, um, also being mindful of, of uh, your time, I just want to, to ask you after this um, a bit like some, some words of advice, some words of wisdom um, for, for other governments, local governments that are looking to uh, source food more sub sustainably. Um, but before we get into to that part, I, I do want to ask you the the role of a procurer, of a public procurer in the state of Bahia, because you, you mentioned the important role of the city mayors, of the nutritionists, also of the, the smallholder farmers. And, and um, I'm, I'm wondering, how would you describe the role of a procurer in, in this program? How important is it? When we are talking about the the role of the public procurement, it's important to mention that the challenges consist of a lack of habit and technique of using public procurement for the development of public policies. In this specific case, uh, the public policy of school feeding and its impacts on the promotion of human and environmental health and also uh, social justice. Um, all these these subjects are connected, and we have no doubt that when we we work and think the the whole under the whole perspective, um, the the challenges um, get get small get smaller. 
I can say that the role of the procurement within the food chain is is really really very important, especially because um, as we said, the the public procurement here, the the government is a really really big buyer, big uh, big buyer. So the the government can use this strength, this uh, to to propose new and necessary patterns towards a more healthier, a healthier and more sustainable uh, parameters, especially when we are talking about children, when we are talking about fundamental guarantees such as food security, uh, uh, education, health. So I have no doubt that the 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 whole of the the procurement is is important when we talk and when we work under this vision. Yeah, thank you so much for for clarifying and kind of um, emphasizing the importance of of procurement as a key tool for a sustainable food system. Leticia, what are your kind of words of wisdom, kind of to to other local governments? How to start? What what is important to keep in mind for a sustainable food procurement strategy? Before our, our uh, final words, uh, I just like to share a, 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 a great um, information that consists in our actual phase of the pilot, our project. We are not more just talking about a pilot project, um, considering the, the results, the positive results that were found. The Sustainable School Program had its pilot state completed in November 2000, 2000 last year. And the initiative has been qualified to an institutional level, which is in currently in development. Uh, and the actual phase built on the pilot stage experience maintains the same goals, that's the promotion of the Brazilian public policy of school feeding through a systemic approach with a focus on promoting its quality, food security, and combating childhood obesity through the empowerment of the smallholder farmers and the awareness of the sustainability requirements target to comply with the existing Brazilian international commitments, such as the United Nations Sustainable Deve Development Goals. Uh, indeed, uh, some methodological adjustments have been implemented to allow its replication throughout the state of Bahia. Uh, the current form has been planned to be able to support multiple backgrounds related to the school feeding, but this time with no food source limitation as long as healthy and preferentially provided by small farmers, encouraging as well sustainable choices and discouraging the offer of processed food. So the, repli the replication could be more easily facilitated in an institutional scale performance. Uh, uh, Due to the coronavirus pandemic, the program waits the retaking of the school activities to restart. I, I just like to say that it was a pleasure to join One Planet and local governments for sustainability in this project. Thank you very much. Uh, we also thank the listeners of this podcast. And our sustainable school program has its doors open to welcome uh, you here and also those mayors, those stakeholders, all those who want to share their experience with us and also to know uh, our experience uh, to, to get, because we, we should get strength, strength, strength this kind of movement. Um, we are uh, we are aimed at strength this kind of movement about sustainable public procurement because it's a, a need. Uh, we need this change. We need this vision, um, and we have no doubt about the the power, the power how powerful the public procurement can be. Um, uh, is still when we we are talking about this small changes because our our initiative is a small small initiative just in four cities and now we are preparing to to this uh, institutional scale but 
small shifts can be a, a big shift, a big change for, for a family, for a smallholder farmer, for that mother that is with, with her children alone and have to get food and get money. So we have to be awareness awareness of all this this kind of perspective especially after uh, the pandemic I, I i have we 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 definitely the pandemic could teach us many 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 lessons and one of these lessons i have no doubt is about is related to the empath empathy is that is the so um yep. Uh, we have to to Absolutely. use the the law as an important tool to promote, to foster, to correct this kind of uh, uh, of um, of things that are are now in our near us, um, and that our doors are open to welcome you here in Brazil and strengthen even more the global movement for a healthier in more fair and more sustainable world. After all, we are all together on one planet. That's beautiful. Thank you, Letitia. De nada. Sejam bem-vindos à Escola Sustentável. Welcome to the Sustainable School Program. Thank you so much. And really, we can't wait to hear where this is taking you. And, and it's beautiful to hear that this initiative is being institutionalized. So thanks a lot. I think there's a lot in it that we will have to process, but uh, it will be in in inspiring. And one day I hope that we can really meet and uh, read this sustainable feijoada. <laughs> and uh, again, mucho obrigada and uh, have a wonderful day. The same to you. Thank you so much. And I hope we can meet someday here in Brazil. What an episode, what a champion. I'm longing for a sustainable feijoada. Me too, actually. Such an inspiring story. Really good to talk to Leticia. And their story really shows how to leverage procurement to impact how the food is being grown, processed, cooked and consumed. Thank you again uh, to Leticia for joining us on the Power of the Public Plate podcast and for their amazing work in Bahia. To learn more about the Sustainable School Program in Bahia, check out the description of, of this episode. And if you like this episode, you can support us by sharing it with your colleagues and friends. And we also invite you to check out all the other episodes and to connect with us on Twitter or our websites of the UN One Plan Network, as well as Eclay Local Governments for Sustainability. Thank you so much for listening. Stay committed. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Goodbye.